Hi everyone. Um, nice to see you all again. Um, it's been a long time, 24 hours since we've last spoke. Um, and today we're pretty much just finishing off the second half of our C++ Basics lecture. So we started our C++ Basics lecture yesterday, um, but there's more to go through today. And we'll see how we go. Um, honestly, like the first few weeks of content aren't super hard. So if we finish early, then we will uh, finish early otherwise we'll see how we go but um let's get stuck into it so essentially these slides where we got to yesterday was we got to um we got to the end of expressions and then we kind of got onto value semantics but i feel like we might we didn't get to that specifically but let's talk about it now so um a shortcut to full screen. So with um, with C++, we've already kind of talked about this a couple of times, how it copies things, right? And um, this is again very different from Java um, in the sense that it both... I'm just trying to think about a comparison to Java. So I know I know not all of you know Java, so um, I think there was a few people posting in the on the forum or in the feedback yesterday that was like, uh, um, "What, like, what if I don't know Java?" And it's like, just it's just because Comp two five one one is a prereq, so I'm not a hundred percent sure. Maybe for postgrads it's different, but if you're an undergrad, it, it is an assumption that you're you're familiar with Java, um, so we kind of have to operate that way too. But essentially, if you were writing in something like Java and you said for instance, something like string s equals new string hello, and then you said string s2 equals s, they would be the same string with the same reference, right? And then if you did something like, you know, an equivalent of assert s equals s2, um, then that would also be true because you'd be checking if two references point to the same heap object, right? Um, and if you want to check if, you know, if there's two separate things, you do the whole, um, you know, dot equals in Java. Now, like where C++ differs on this front is that um, it does do a copy here instead of a reference, but also when you do comparisons, it's actually like the equals by default won't necessarily compare the pointer. It will it will do the Java dot equals equivalent. It will actually compare the values. So for instance, strings, two whole separate different strings, which is what hello and hello2 are, two separate pieces of memory, um, they completely like um, when you compare them it actually goes through the character arrays each like it doesn't say are you the same piece of memory it says do you have the same values and that's what we mean by value semantics so semantics I think is, is, is what, how would you describe it it's what describes meaning the branch of linguistics concerned with meaning so um, that means that a lot of things in C++ have a lot of meaning focused on their value, not so much their reference and stuff. And, and the rest of the example here, I think you can kind of understand intuitively. If we get onto a more interesting topic like type conversion, um, then we can talk a little bit about how C++ differs from C. So with C, you're probably, some of you would be aware that you could do something, for instance, like say int A equals five and then double B equals double a, or in some cases you can actually just say double C equals A. Um, now, there's a couple of things like happening here which I think you need to be familiar with. The first one is that, in this case here, everyone understands, you know, A equals, a equals 5. In this case here, what we're doing is we're casting um, a copy of A to B, and we're kind of setting it as a double. So this is kind of the, your C explicit cast thing. Now, you don't have to do this in this case because a double is a more precise version of an integer in general and therefore uh, the compiler is comfortable knowing that you can convert from an integer to a double without a loss in precision. And without that loss in precision this is what we would call an implicit cast or an implicit type conversion. Something like this though gets a bit trickier because the char is, is um, one byte but an int is four bytes. So there's particularly a lossy conversion here and a standard compiler won't actually let you do something like this because it's aware that there's a loss in that conversion um, but 
in some languages like C, you can often cast anything to, well, not anything to anything, but you can sometimes cast things. So you can sometimes force that A to be a char. Um, the kind of casting rules that you might have been exposed to for C are a little bit fast and loose sometimes. So what we're kind of focusing on here is um, the implicit type conversion in C++, which is very familiar. And then we're going to look at the explicit type conversion, which is a little bit, um, a little bit different. So first one is um, implicit promoting conversion. So if I have an auto I equals zero, and then I have an auto D equals zero, um, we can set D to be equal to I, just like I said there. We can implicitly cast, we can implicitly convert, or in this case, we call it implicitly promote because it's going from an int to a double, an int to a double. Um, and we can see that in action here. So we've got our um, int i equals 42. We try and cast it and this should all behave totally fine. Um, and you know, I'll just run this again. Sweet, and then we'll do build source demo. Uh, sorry, le build lectures lecture one demo 106. All tests passed. Okay, cool. So that that silent conversion does work. Um, Alwyn asks a great question, which is why are there curly braces here? Well, in this case, the curly braces are actually there just to help make it look like the uh, catch2 um, here, like, because, you know, we, we define this and then inside the catch2 block we do that. Um, but in reality, what actually happens is that um, you can get away with writing code that just looks like this. Like, you could just say auto k equals 5 and then you could say auto l equals 3. Um, you could do that. Um, but we're not going to get to that till week three. It's not really something you need to be concerned with, but it's definitely possible. Um, Jin says, so is it a typo in lecture code that i equals zero? No, it's, it's not a typo. Um, oh, I mean, it's just different. It's like all the same stuff. Like the, the, lecture, the lecture code doesn't... Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I guess it's a typo. I'm not sure really how that happened since they're copied and pasted, but yeah. The, the lecture code is often like not the true source, like it's not the source of truth. In general, the lecture code is like we write it and then we copy it into the lecture slides and sometimes we have to cut things out. So do, do take the lecture stuff with a grain of salt. Um, Cause you know, um, yep. Okay, so the other part of type conversions though, which is equally as important is um, explicit promoting conversions. So in that, in this case, it's where you um, you explicitly tell the compiler that you'd like to convert something. Um, and what this means is the only difference in the previous example, though, is that instead of just saying d equals i, we've actually said here d equals static cast double of i. So static cast is a function that is built in to the C++ core library, so you don't actually have to import anything. Um, and it has a couple of purposes. So one of the first purposes is that it tells, well, has the main purpose, honestly, which is that it tells the programmer exactly what you're doing. It gives a lot of intent because um, casting or type conversions are a common source of errors in code because, you know, there's like maybe a loss in precision or some kind of other strange conversion. Um, and therefore, we like to try and be explicit about things. So in this case, we're going to try and statically cast a, an into a double, um, and we put this here. Now, what actually happens here compared to the previous example, I think, is in this example, the right hand side of the assignment is a an int. And then we assign it to the double. And during that assignment process is where the promotion happens. It's where the type conversion happens. In the second case here, this static cast will actually take the int and it will promote it to a double. So the right hand side of this is now a double and therefore the assignment from the right hand side to the left hand side is actually just an assignment, you know, just set the double to be the double. Is one better or quicker functionally, performance wise? Not really. Um, again, this one's just a lot clearer. 
um, to people what's happening because you, you always want to kind of yell and scream when something's being casted. What happens though if we try and swap that around? So what happens if instead here I maybe try and then say auto const e equals static cast char um, of i. The other, the other cool thing about static cast is it is it means you don't actually have to write the type over here because in this case here, we kind of said auto d equals 0.0, .0 but in actual fact, it, we kind of would have just written that normally, or you'd have to say double d equals i, because you can't, you can't really say auto d equals i, because that would just make it an int, right? Because it will infer the type of d based on the right-hand side. So that's kind of why we had to fudge it by setting it to be 0.0, .0. but let's try and run this one. Okay, we get an error, and the error is unused variable e, okay. So I'm going to deal with my unused variable just by voiding it. That's a common technique you can use. Okay, it worked. Now let's try and run it. All tests passed. Well, I guess that makes sense. Let's try printing it out. Let's see what it does. Um, standard C out E. Oops. Sorry, I have to import. Um, like. In some of these, in some of these examples, I like to just print things because I know I could write a test for it. But I'm also familiar from my experience teaching these courses that students often need something tactile, like they need to actually see something printing and running. So I'm going to run it again, and it did not print anything. That's not very nice of it. I wonder why that is. That's very. St oh, there it is. Sorry, no, it's a star. That was, oh, okay, yeah, that, okay, I understand. So, whew, yeah, it's uh, it's casted the I, which is um, 42, um, to a uh, char, and then we've tried to print that, and um, we look up our good old friend, Mr. ASCII table, um, Mr. or Mrs. or they ASCII table, and we get 42, which is a star. I can't read ASCII tables. Star, there we go. So that works. But here's the question, what happens if we actually try and type convert something huge? Like let's say something well beyond the size of one byte, because remember, what's one byte, which is the size of a char, what's the maximum size it can be? Um, I just tried to click on the first thing on Google, I mean the answer is 8 bits, right? So it's 2 to the power of 8, which would be 256. So 255 is the biggest it can be. So let's try and make something bigger than that. Let's do something like 500 here. And I'll just adjust some of these tests. Let's try this build, 106. Okay, run. Ooh, we got a funny little symbol here. So that's a bit strange. I'm not really sure what that is. Let's try and print it out as an int. Um, so Sarush has asked, what is void E for again? Um, void E is essentially just a way of using E. It's basically a statement that we do nothing with its return value. It's an easy way to force the compiler to think that you're actually using something and is great during um, debugging. Okay, so, so here's the strange things about what's happened and why you have to like be careful with this stuff because um, we started with 500 as an int, we statically casted it to a char, which wasn't a promotion because we've lost precision, we've gone from a 4 byte integer to a 1 byte char, and then we've casted it back to an int and tried to print it out, and what we get is negative 12, and that doesn't make any sense, I don't think, right? Does anyone know why it's negative 12? I can't... Oh, I guess that makes sense, 256 times 2. Um, so basically it's like overflowed here, so I mean the simple math of it's like we had 500 which is 256, it overflows 256 um, which basically gets you up to, um, anyway I won't go through that, but it's, it's, a, it's like if you think about it, 256 times 2 is 512 and we got negative 12 which essentially means that we've gone um, kind of 12 too far in a way. I mean, you can go away and think about that. This course isn't really on like overflows specifically. We can maybe come back to that if we have extra time. So, 
Next. Any questions about casting? Just before we move on. Uh, why did my cast of int in the print fail? I think it failed because the compiler was like, please don't do that. It was like, that's an old style of casting. So this compiler that we have in the course, I didn't set it up originally, but I'm pretty sure it has some extra warnings turned on. Um, I just, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, it'd be in some config file that I haven't looked at, but um, yeah, there's some things you can't do that like normal G++ would let you do. So like just, just going G++ without any like any flags of any type is like, it'll just do whatever it humanly can. Um, so this one is just a little bit more strict. Okay, so let's move on to functions. Functions in C++. This one shouldn't be too bad um, because it's a lot like other languages. First thing is, um, we have a whole bunch of functions. Now, there are there are actual names for these things, like functions with no parameters are called nullary functions. Functions with one param are called unary functions. Unary means like one. Um, functions with two are called binary functions. Um, and they're all exactly what you'd expect. I don't want to talk about this because I hope you all understand it. Um, one subtle thing... <coughs> oh God, sorry about that. I tried to breathe and swallow at the same time. Um, one subtle thing though is uh, since the introduction of C++20 there is another type of function syntax that you can do um, which is the top one here. So the bottom one is what we've kind of written so far in the course which is just like your standard C style int main, standard C out and stuff. Um, whereas the one up the top here, it's what it's done is it's taken the return type of the function, it's put it on the other side of the function with a little dash arrow and then it's put auto out the front. Um, now, this is something that one of the people who helps uh, with the course, Chris DeBella, um, is really passionate about. And essentially, I think my understanding of it is that it aligns better with Lambda syntax, which is what we're going to be talking about next week. So it try it's trying to add more consistency to the overall way that you define functions in the course. Um, I think some students last term found it a bit awkward, so we won't enforce the specific use of... Um, the new style of function syntax, but what we will do is we will ask you to be consistent. So if you want to use the bottom one, use it. If you want to use the top one, use it. Um, just be consistent. And remember, the top one will not work with older compilers. So I'll give you an example of this. Like, uh, actually, this is actually a great example to show you different C++ versions, which I talked about in my tute today. By the way, speaking of that, I accidentally hit pause on my tute, so um, I kind of botched the recording. I'm really sorry. So Simon recorded his tutorial so if you want a full tutorial here, you can go watch it. If you want my crappy 12 minute one, <laughs> you can watch it here. Um, but yeah, let's get onto this. So this is our function. Um, I'm just gonna open up a standard, uh, sorry, I'm trying to get back here. I'm gonna open up a standard terminal and I'm gonna make a file then we'll call it like old.cpp. And I'm just gonna paste this in here. So this is just our old kind of function thing. If I try and G++ this, let me just get rid of that. If I try and G++ old, it uh, seems to work. Why does it work? Oh, I didn't think it would work. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's defaulting to C++ 20 now. Maybe it does that. Let me try this. Huh. Okay. Maybe that's a bad example of a C++ 20 feature. <laughs> just walked into a trap there. Um... I'm actually surprised that compiled. That's good. That means you're less likely to run into problems. So what we'll see later in the course is that there are different versions of C++. And again, I talked to 15 people about this in my tutorial today, but um, there's essentially version 98, 11, 14, 17, and 20. Um, 98 to 11 had the biggest jump. Um, most of you after this course, like all of the code you write in this course could easily be modified slightly to work with um, uh, C++ 11. So in a lot of ways, you, you kind of got to think about you're really learning like C++ 11 with bonus things because that's the big uh, shift change. 
But there's a lot of stuff you'd write in this course that you would never get compiling with C++ 98 because it's just so kind of different and basic. Um, but we kind of cover features in all these different areas and we'll talk about them. Honestly, I, I could be wrong about the function thing. That's not really my forte. Um, I'll go and have a look at that for you. But essentially, oh, sorry, I jumped the gun. Um, essentially, there's just those two different styles and you can kind of pick the one that works for you. Okay, um, in terms of functions, one thing that C++ has that C doesn't, that many other programming languages do, is the addition of default arguments. So when you define a function, like in this case, a, a function called RGB that returns a, a standard string, um, you can give it RG and B as shorts, which are like two bytes, I think. Um, and you can give them default arguments so that if people don't enter them, it'll actually call it with default arguments. Again, this is pretty common practice in most programming languages. So if you've done any other language besides C, you might have been exposed to this in some way. Um, but yeah, you can see if you just call RGB, even though there are three parameters, it will still take it and it will just pre-populate them as zero. Um, the only actual thing that you can uh, not do is, is once you define the first parameter in the list, you can't default the rest. So like in this case here, if you want to, if you want to explicitly state R, um, then you have to, you have to, sorry, if you want to explicitly state something, you have to make sure everything before it's defined. I got that around the wrong way. Um, so in this case, if you want to explicitly define G, you're also going to have to define R. That's just how it works. So once you want to define one, everything before it has to be defined. Some languages like Python will uh, not necessarily want that. But in C++, it's, it's kind of in between being crappy and very flexible. Um, the only other thing I want to note in this course is a really good piece of uh, syntax lingo to get your head around is the, the difference between parameters and arguments. So parameters are up here. Parameters are really what's in our function declarations and definitions, whereas arguments are what we call particular values that we give to our function calls. So formally speaking it's like you would call r a parameter g a parameter b a parameter in this context but 100 100 200 200 they are arguments um so i mean you could also call this default parameters but that's just a useful piece of knowledge i think to help separate out some ideas in your head um one thing that c also has is function overloading we're playing around with the new syntax here so what function overloading is in a language like C++ is that you can redefine the same named function multiple times if the input parameters differ. So in this case, I've got a function or a name called square. I have a name called square, which is a function, and it takes in an int const x, and I can define that function. I can also define another function with the exact same name square um, with a double const x. Um, and the compiler will be totally fine with it. And the reason is because it doesn't affect how the compiler does lookup. So for instance, if you call square with a 2, it's going to go look up the first function. If you call square with a 2.0, which is a double, it's going to go look up the second function. Now a big thing that kind of comes up in this course a lot is how compilers think. And it's very relevant to this course. So for example, you can ask yourself the question, what happens if I just define this bottom one? What happens if I didn't have this one at the top here? So if we just had, say, that. Would this still work? Yes, it would still work. And that's because when the compiler is doing its compilation, um, it would take this two and it would say it's an int. And then it would go, huh, OK, I can't see any square functions that take in an int. But what I can find is a double and I can convert an int to a double without any loss in precision. So it considers this one maybe not the ideal fit, but one that is still appropriate and it will compile fine with that. Whereas if you kind of had, you know, a square where you used a string, the compiler would simply say, I'm sorry, this doesn't exist because it can't find it at all. Um, Edward says, does the parameter usually uh, need to be set as const? Well, again, what were the rules we talked about in the first part of this? It was that everything should be const by default unless you need it to be mutable. So in this case, we don't need to mutate the x inside the function because we're just squaring it and returning. And therefore, we make it be const because there's no need to change it. 
So if we have a look here, we got um, these functions. This is all written out here if you want to go play around with the code. Um, we have our two square definitions, int and double. Um, a common mistake people make when it comes to these functions is that they will think that um, this one is also an override. Like if they say something like this, they'll be like, ah oh, yes, this one is different. Uh, sorry, that's not what I meant. They'll say, oh, now I'd actually like a function that will take in a double and return an int. So when it comes to the function overloading rules in C++, you can't count um, different return values. So essentially it's all the parameters. So, so as far as the compiler is concerned, these two are identical because they have the same name and they have the same parameters. It doesn't care about the return value. Um, Izzy says, stupid question, but is the check function similar to the assert function in C? Yes, so um, in catch2, um, check and require are very similar to the assert function. It's just that check won't crash the test. So I think require is most similar to the um, most similar to the assert function, this one here. So I think if this isn't true, it will crash. And I think you usually, I don't know if it will crash, sorry, I think it might end the test or end the section or something like that. I don't know off the top of my head, but the idea with check is that so conceptually speaking, you would check something if it can be not true and the rest of the test still makes sense. Whereas if you require something, you're basically saying, if this isn't true, we should really stop testing this bit. So in this case, it's saying, let's make sure these two strings are equal. And if they're not, let's stop. We want to abort, the, oh, you abort the test case. It was written in my notes, thank you. Um, you abort the test case if this expression is false, but a check will keep going if it's false. And that makes sense here because if the strings aren't the same, something's deeply wrong, but if um, if the back of the string's not right, then you could probably still run a number of other tests. So that's a little bit of a tip for the assignment. Speaking of the assignment, I have to release that. We'll talk about that at the end, that's right. Um, okay. Um, so the overload rules, I've, I've kind of talked about this uh, just briefly then, but essentially the compiler will look for all the functions with the same name, and then it will look for the ones that have the same arguments, um, or at least has the ability to convert some arguments, and then it will find the best match. So in this case, if you call f with 5.6, the compiler will look at all four functions. It will rule out g because the name's different. It will then rule out the second one, because it has a different number of arguments. Because the, the, sorry, when I say the second one, I mean the third one. And what it will leave is these two here. So it'll leave the auto f int and the auto f double double, because both of them can have one argument, right? And then it will look for the one um, that it can type with better, essentially like type matching better. So in this case, it'll choose the, uh, the, yeah, it'll choose this one here because a double is a better match than um, an int because it's a double, right? So it doesn't want to lose precision. It doesn't want to go down to the int. So in this case, it would match with the F down there. Um, a really important note when it comes to overloads, which is a common mistake some students can make, is you should always write overloads that are trivial. And what that means is that if you have three different functions, like that are all called F, or you have two different functions that are both called square, they should have the exact same behavior. So if you ever overload functions, it should have no different behavior. It should have the same semantic. It should have the same expectations. Um, and if it doesn't, you, you give it another function name. Don't try and be all cute and pretty just because you think you can function overload. It's like if, if they are different, if they are not literally the same function in terms of its behavior and expectations, then you just give it a different name. Okay, if statements. Um, I'm not going to run a ton of code with this unless I get asked to, but if statements in C++ are really similar, um, this is just a function that has an if statement in it, what you'd expect. Um, uh, Zin, I, uh, I don't actually know, I don't think it will because it, it'll consider it a downcast. Um, the other thing you can do in C++ is uh, conditionals, um, shorthand conditionals. So instead of using if else statements, you can use um, the uh, ternary if statements, which are the question mark and the colon. 
Um, this is essentially, you might have seen this in languages like Python, where instead of saying if, then, else, then, this is now saying like if, then, else, then, like that. Um, if you're not really familiar with this, then you can Google ternary if statements. That's T-E-R-N-R-A-Y, like it's really quick to Google ternary if statements. Um, and you'll see like they're all the same in every different language. Right, this is just from JavaScript, the first one I found. Um, we're not here to teach that because it's not required in the course. It's more just like for people who are familiar with it. The point is you can do it um, in C++. Probably the only thing to be cautious of <coughs> is that it can make code shorter, but that doesn't make it easier to read. And your objective is to make code easier to read, not to make it shorter. So in this case here, um, this can kind of nearly be harder to read, so you just have to use it with caution so that you don't make your code unreadable. C++ also has switch statements. Um, these are exactly what you'd expect. These are pretty much identical to C, so nothing much to say here. Um, the, uh, the brackets fall through is... Uh, I don't think that's actual syntax. I, think, I don't think it is. I mean, we can try it out. Let's uh, let's let's do it really simply. Let's do our basic. Uh, let's do switch dot cpp. We'll just do this one on terminal. I'm pretty sure of, I can't remember. Yeah, uh, one to find reference to main. Oh, sure. Huh. Okay, maybe it is a thing. I have a feeling I got asked this last year. I don't really use it, so. There you go. Well, here's a cool example. So this is a feature that was added in C++ 17. So now let's try and actually compile this with C++ 14. I don't think I understand G++ very well because that shouldn't work. <laughs> um, I don't know why it works. I would expect that it wouldn't because it's a, it's a different feature here. So what this is saying is that in C++ 17, they created is it meant to be double dash or? I don't know. I'll, look, I'll figure that out later. Sorry, guys. Um, they added a new piece of syntax, which was square bracket, square bracket, fall through. Um, and it's I think it's a way, it's only be used in a switch statement where the next statement is to be executed as a statement with a case or default label for that switch statement. Um, optimize out, yeah, quite possibly. Um, so this is quite interesting. I mean, again, this is my point. I don't, I don't keep a catalog of everything about C++ on the top of my head. But let's, uh, let's delete one and see what happens. See, what I'm wondering here is like, why not just have case zero? Like, surely that still works. You know, like nothing's particularly wrong with that. Um, I could probably read this more. It's just I don't want you guys to sit here watching me try and understand something. Um, indicates that a fall through in the previous case is, it should not be diagnosed by a compiler that warns on fall through. Oh, okay, sure. So, essentially, um, what this was was that um, compilers would sometimes have warnings in them if cases fell through, right? Because you know in a standard switch state when you're meant to include breaks everywhere. So it's like case zero, something break. Case one, something break. Um, but if you didn't have that break, sometimes compilers would be like, hey, friend, um, I think you might have forgotten the break there and people would be like, I know what I'm doing, don't tell me what I forget. So this fall through here is actually just a message to both the programmers and the compiler that um, they know what they're doing, right? So I'm like, I know what I'm doing, pretty simple. Yeah. I've never used that personally because I don't use switch statements much at all in my life, but um, that's good to know. I think it's cool how it's a C++ 17 feature as well. Um, it just kind of starts to give you a sense of these like little things that have come up in different versions. Generally you'll find that C++ 17 would be the standard in pretty much everywhere and C++ 20 is probably like becoming a lot more mainstream. Um, next is sequenced collections. So we're kind of I think past um, the basics of the language and we're starting to actually look at different data structures now. So the basics are done and now we're going to have a look at um, the beginning of sequence collections. We're going to talk more about sequence collections in week two where we go into a lot more detail of it. 
but at the moment we're just going to focus on um, we're just going to focus on how to actually interact with it. So we talked yesterday about a standard vector um, and a standard vector oops wrong one a standard vector is basically an array list is what I said so it's a it's a you could think of it like a C array or a C link list or an array list or whatever in reality it's a dynamically sized array so it's actually an array um, underneath the hood um, but it kind of feels like a Python list or a Java array list or something like this so we create ourselves a vector which is like a list or an array of ints and we can immediately populate it like this. We'll get into the why of this later as well. Um, so there it is, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, like that. The next thing um, we can do is we can make a copy of it. So I'm going to copy my vector to a second vector, and then I'm going to check if they're equal. And they should be equal because of how things work, and we've talked about that. Then we can access elements of that vector like this, um, by saying I'd like the second index two item of that and we assume and we set it to be zero. So just like C in other languages, the second index is number two here, and then we check if they're not equal to each other anymore, which is what we expect. Um, and we can try that out. We can we we can print out um, more single digits two and have a look at it together. Oops. I have to include IO stream. Cool, so I got zero. Now what happens if we try and print out the vector? Let's actually try and print out the vector. See what it does, see what the compiler says. Okay, so we've got an error here and that error is that um, no known conversion from standard vector to standard null point, blah, blah, blah. Um, now we're going to get more into this into week four, but what is happening here is that it's basically saying the compiler has no idea how to stream a vector to an output stream, right? Like standard out. So the compiler's like, I don't know how to do that. Um, and we could help it, but like for now, we could just do something. Um, simpler. Uh, this will come up in like one of the next lecture slides so we can skip over it when we get there but like in the meantime we could just do like a simple for loop right we could say um, int i equals zero we could say for int i equals zero i is less than more single digits dot size plus plus i um, and then we could just add this here and say more single digits i there are better ways to loop but I'm just keeping it simple for now build 109 uh, oh this happens oh so here's one of the downsides of a language like C++ is it gets a bit more involved because when you have a vector um, the actual size here right um, it actually returns something that isn't an int and we can look that up in the library so if I go to standard vector here um, and we have a look at size. What size will return us, it actually says is a size type. It's a bit of a rabbit hole here. But then if we like, uh, you know, C++ size type, uh, it kind of gets a bit complicated. But the point is that the actual type is like not an int. It's not straightforwardly an int. And therefore, sometimes you might have to do something like this or even better, or maybe better, let's try auto, see what happens here. So auto doesn't really like this either, um, because, yeah, so what's happened here with auto is that it has uh, implicit conversion change sign this int to blah, 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 blah. So I think one aspect of auto, like, um, there are some rules around auto too, like, for instance, auto doesn't carry across the const, so if you say something like auto const a equals 5 and then you say auto b equals 6 auto b equals a it copies it but it doesn't like auto doesn't pick up the const as well you know um, and I, I think with auto it might not do some things to do with the signness as well but the main point is that auto 
um, doesn't carry all the information. So in this case, I think what's happening is even though it's like a size T or an unsigned int, um, it's just like, oh, well, I, I'll just leave it as an int. So it is capturing it as an int the same, but then it's, um, yeah, then it's losing it after basically. Um, Matthew says, would auto i equals digits dot size and count down to zero work? Probably. So that's an interesting thing um, that Matthew has said here, which is basically that um, if I was to instead say, let's start with auto i equals the size, and then we loop while i is greater than zero, and then we decrement this, this might work now because, you know, does the size return the right thing? So that works, right? Because i is actually being set correctly here, because previously it was just a zero being, you know, derived from the zero, whereas now it's actually like the size type. Um, we could also probably play around with things here if we wanted to. Um, instead of using auto, we might be able to say like standard size T. I think that's what type it might be. Or maybe we have to use a different size type. So standard size T is the actual like underlying type here as well. So that would probably be the most um, endorsed approach. We like things like size T because it's a nice abstraction, like unsigned int. Um, there's, there's, there's no way for an unsigned int to like um, be taken over later. Like if someone changes the, the sorry, I just saw something funny. Um, if someone like the C++ compiler decides that we want to do a different way of doing vectors, it's kind of locked into like an unsigned int, whereas a size T is a nice little abstraction of things. Um, so that's how we do that. And we could loop through it and we could print it all out now. Yep, zero, one, zero, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, and you can see that that's mutated there. And if we tried to print out the single digits one, uh, it would not have the two, it would not have the two to become zero because that's a whole separate thing. That's why we copied it. Okay. Great. So, oops. Did I do the wrong one? Yep. So you'll see it's zero, one, two there. So that's the basics of a vector. It behaves a lot like other array type structures that you might have seen in other courses. Um, I would like to skip this slide. I wasn't sure if I wanted to teach it, but we can come back to it next week. But it kind of, no, I want to skip this slide. I'll probably just delete it. I was a bit unsure about it, but I decided now I don't want to do it. So that's the basics of vector. Pretty simple. We're going to get into one of the most important parts of C++ basics here, which is reference. Um, which it references, which is uh, kind of like C pointers. So in C, you have this kind of ability to pass things by value or pass things by reference at will. Um, and it's actually something that you don't have a lot of control over in other languages. So for instance, if you, if you use Java again, all the primitive types, ints, doubles, bools, chars, they're all values and you can't pass them by reference. You can only ever copy them. And then, um, but all the, the heap items, like the actual objects are um, passed by reference. And you can't, like you have to be explicit to pass them by value. In C++, because everything's by value, we need a mechanism to make things by reference. Now, if we were thinking along our C logic, we could solve this just by using pointers, right? I'm not sure if I have the example I was hoping for here. I might have gotten rid of it. Yeah, so I really want to demonstrate this to you um, maybe in a little bit more detail than kind of, you know, we might have planned. So I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to comment out some of this stuff here. So in C++, if you want to create a swap function, right, and you do something like int A and B like this, and it's going to swap some things. Now, if I have a main function here where I say int i equals 5 and int j equals 6, and then I print out um, i equals 5, j equals 6, like this, um, this program will compile, right? Like we're not actually using the swap function yet, but let's just start simple. Um, and I'm getting complaints because I didn't write code correctly. Classic. So this compiles, it runs. When I try and run it, I get i equals 5, j equals 6. 
Now if I call swap and I pass in i and j, we all know this, this won't work because I'm passing this in by value. This is something we would have learned at the beginning of first year. Um, even if I wrote this function correctly and I said, you know, int temp equals a and then a, a equals b and then b equals temp. Even if I did something like that, it's still not going to work because we're passing in them by value. Those values here are put on the stack locally and then deleted and it does not affect the, uh, like, the stuff outside. If we wanted to do the C style, we would do this. We would say, um, <coughs> we would pass these in as pointers and then we would do some funky, ugly, confusing pointer crap, which no one likes doing because it's confusing and it's seg fault sometimes. So we do something like this. We pass in the addresses of these pieces of memory and then we like dereference them. And this is fine, but it's a bit confusing to make sense of. And then even more than that, it's, it's really gonna lead you to making seg faults because you're dealing with memory directly now. So that works. We've swapped them now, but I don't like it. You shouldn't like it. So in C++, we actually have this notion of a reference. And references are really great because syntactically it looks very similar to passing by value. Um, but what we're doing here instead is when we define variables, if we put an ampersand after the type, we are telling the compiler that we would like these to be passed in by reference. So it effectively acts like a pointer, but it's not dealing with pointers. What it's saying to the compiler is when someone passes i into the swap function, please give me a reference to that. So if I modify it within my function, it actually modifies what it's referencing. So now with as little as just these two ampersands here, when I go and build this, it says i equals j, i equals 6, j equals 5. So that's references, right? We'll talk about the details of it, but that's like the tactile physical interaction you'd use with it. It's like you, you, I'm passing something by reference now without having to F around with pointers. Um, in terms of getting into the details a bit more, um, a reference is an alias for another object. It's not a pointer. It's not a pointer. It's just similar to a pointer in behavior. Um, you don't need to use the dash arrow to access elements. It's treated just like a normal object. It can't be null. Both of those things are the case because it's not a pointer. Um, but I think one of the most important things that differs it is, is that if we go back to our kind of provided examples before I jumped into my little tangent there, one thing about references is that once they're set, you can't change them. And this kind of gets a little bit confusing. So if I say auto i equals 5, I now have an integer called i, which is 1, I print it out, and then when I say auto reference, j equals i, what this becomes is this becomes a int reference because i is a reference. So auto denote, like auto um, derives that it's an int and then the ampersand means it's a reference. Um, and then when I say j equals three, what is happening here is that I'm not changing what j points to or anything pointery. I'm actually saying that i equals three effectively because j and i are now just names. They are just like variable names that point to the same piece of stack memory, which is this i here. So now when I print them out, I would get the same value because they both are the same thing. j and i are the same thing. j's, j's a reference um, just to the same object. And we can have a look at that. Let's just run that really quick. Great, one, three, three, that's what we expect. One is i and then we update j and i is updated too because they're both the same thing. Um, great, so now we say auto k equals one. So k is now an int. And what we're doing here instead is we're using a const reference. So now this type is gonna be int const reference. So it's an int because that's what auto did for us. It's const because we've set it's const and then it's a reference because we've set it's a reference. So ref is now a const reference to k. What const references are, are things that cannot, it's like a read only reference. So if you have a const reference to something, you can print it, um, but you can't modify it. So you'll see here I have my k, I'm allowed to increment my k, which will work, and reference will update, but I can't plus plus reference. So if we just look at these lines of code between 18 and 22 here, and I go to run them, this will work. 
um, we'll print out reference, it'll be 1, we increment k and then we print reference again and because it's pointing to k, we're well not pointing, because it's referencing k, um, it will give me the same value. So I'll get, just look at the bottom three lines here. Oh, just these two lines, sorry. Um, I get 1 and then I get 2 because we incremented k. If I tried to do ref++, the compiler's going to stop me because the compiler has enough information to tell me that it's all not good. Cannot assign to variable ref with const qualified type const in ampersand. So it's basically like, hey, I just saw you try and increment or modify something that's const. Don't do that, please. Um, Yep, and then I'm just looking here. And then the only other thing to keep in mind is that if you make something const, any reference to it also has to be const. So here I've got myself an int const, right? Because it's a con constant integer, um, m equals one. I can make a const reference to it. So I can make an mref, which just is a reference to m. That's totally fine because the reference is const, but I can't do this one here because I can't have a like a mutable reference to something that's immutable. That would like that would make no sense. So the compiler also similarly says here, um, or maybe you can. Maybe it complains if you try and do something with it. I'm not sure. Let's try and actually like print it out. Oh, sorry, ref two. That should be ref two. Ooh, the compiler doesn't mind. Prints out eleven. Oh, one one eleven. <laughs> Hmm. Prints out one one. I was like, why is it eleven? Um, great. So we get one one here, which makes sense. So we we can actually do that. I'm sorry, that's just a problem in my notes, but um, it's implicitly const. So if I try and ref two plus plus, that's where the compiler actually complains, um, because yeah. So I'm guessing what's happening here. So what's actually happening here is that even though I haven't written const, the compiler is adding it for me. It's kind of forcing this to be const. And that you can actually see this in the compilation message here because it says you cannot do anything to ref2 because it has a type const int ampersand. Um, so yes, you just have to be careful around that. Um, so I should just modify that to kind of say like, that's okay. Well, that's just, I mean, you wouldn't say that's not allowed. This is just, this is just stupid. But like saying ref2++ is not allowed. Um, Fiasin is a better practice to have const. I'll answer this for the third time and the third time only, which is that you always want to put const everywhere humanly possible until for some reason you need to modify it, in which case it doesn't become const. Um, and then George says, so you can't point ref2 to something else. Correct. Once you define a reference, that name is permanently referencing that. You can't change where it references. It's not like a pointer where you just make a pointer that points there and then it points here and then it points there. It actually is always pointing to that. So ref2 for as long as it's life now will reference m. That's it. So just a question of whether it's read only or not read only. Um, no, you can make references like that, the people in the chat. That's fine, Ram. Um, and then this other one, if A equals foo and B equals foo, then does A ampersand equal B ampersand? I don't understand your question. I'm not sure if that actually makes sense. You might have to give me a bit of code. But you can always run it yourself, too. Like, um, like it's really easy. Like, we all have computers. You can just put it in. Like, that's what, I'm, that's what I just did a few times here. We just figured that out then. That was something I didn't fully understand. Um, anyway. We're at seven o'clock, so let's take a five minute break and then keep going. Um, and then next after the break, we'll move into pass by value. Oh, I already did this. <laughs> Oops. Um, I think I jumped the gun here. I think I forgot that I had this uh, example. I've been changing these lecture slides around, so I probably made a mistake, but that's good. Saves us more time. All right, let's take a short break and then we'll um, get stuck back into it. Hey. Um, we're getting stuck back into it now. Um, so what I'm going to do is this whole functions pass by value, pass by reference thing. I kind of accidentally did this before while I wanted to explain references. I think I might even swap these slides around a bit because 
in the future um, because I think it's kind of easier to understand references as like a comparison to what you might do in C because references make sense but like why do they exist they want to solve a problem which is to like pass by reference um, so that's all fine there's all the code you can play around with there um, one of the next short pieces is uh, and this this is in the tute one so anyone who had a tute today all four classes probably came across this but with our programming with our programs, there are two important concepts, which are declarations and definitions. Um, and a declaration's job is to make uh, known the type and the name of a, a particular variable or function. Um, and a definition, which is also a declaration, um, tries to, it allocates typically the storage of this type um, and it can only exist once. So every definition can only kind of happen once. So declaration is really just you saying um, this thing like has some certain like properties. And we can kind of see these here, right? Where in this top one here, this is a declaration. So anytime you do a function prototype without an actual body, you might call it the function body. That's what we call a declaration. The second you give it a body, it becomes a definition. And you can see that here on line 11, when we give this one um, a body. So we give this one uh, return one, which, you know, now it's a definition. We can only do this once. If you do this many times, the compiler will be okay with it. If you do that this many times, the compiler will complain that there's been a redefinition. Um, if we make a class here, which we're gonna talk more about in week three, when you actually define, like when you add a body to a class, like with the braces, then that's a definition. Um, and within this class, there is a member function, which is just a declaration because we haven't given it a body. Um, and then we have a definition because it's a function that we have given a body. And then at the bottom here, this gets a little bit more confusing, but all three of these are actually definitions because um, the short answer is that we couldn't do it multiple times. You can't say int i twice, so therefore it's a definition. Um, so the, the obvious giveaway whether something's a definition is if you can't do it more than once in the same scope, um, the second thing that helps uh, for variables give it away is that for variables it's typically you ask yourself the question have I allocated memory here and if you've allocated memory then it's probably a definition so int i int const j auto vd they all allocate memory <coughs> um, in C++ we also have four range statements I don't need to take you through um, for loops because we already know for loops but if you're familiar with other languages then we have four range statements so we had this example here which I butchered where we kind of loop through this vector I want to come back here to demonstrate this because we've already looked at it um, rather than doing this I can actually do things even simpler with a for range loop I can say auto const um, i in single digits that's it or digit this should work, I think. Great. Um, 109, let's go back. 109, 109, there we go. So this one also works. So you can see we printed out the list twice here. So a four range loop is just like Java's four range loops. It's just like Python's four range loops. What you're saying now is you're saying, I want to go and get every element. It's like a for each loop. So I want to go and get every element of single digits. And each time I loop, I want to store it in a variable called digit. Um, generally speaking, most for range loops, the element that you're looping with will have the type auto const reference because you don't want it to be a, you generally don't want to mutate things in a for range loop, um, but it's going to be referenced because that's quicker. It's going to be const because that's quicker and you don't want to modify it and auto is great. The only other thing I haven't commented on about references um, is that um, references are also a little bit quicker and that's why we try to use references where we can. You do have to be careful though because references aren't like, you got to think about it. If you have like a 300 kilobyte struct, it's a lot easier to just use a reference to the struct than copy it even if you're not going to modify it. Um, so for non-primitive types like vectors and other things, if you want to use that vector, or you want to use that thing, then references are better because they're quicker because you don't have to copy memory. It's just like a pointer. It's just really quick. 
So that's loops. I mean, loops are pretty pretty straightforward at the basic level. Um, they're just normal for loops, for range loops. These are for loops that we've seen before. Not a lot to talk about there. You can also go play around with the examples. Um, C++ does have enum types. Um, enum types are just enumerated types, which are basically like a collection of names. Think of it like a like a diction uh, set of strings, if you will. Um, and you can use these if you kind of want to not use numbers. So you know how in like some of your C programs you might do something like you do like hash define Monday is one, hash define Tuesday is two, hash define Wednesday is three. You can get around that in C++ by using this thing here, enum class. So you could say create something that's like, just to give you an example really quick. Um, you could say, okay, I'm gonna call this like days of week. And then you could put here, you know, like Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday, etc. And then when you want to do stuff, you could just say, you know, this is like just the days of week, Monday. There's nothing special about this. It's just a much nicer way to program because you can just use enums instead of having to use like integers or some other horrible placeholder. Um, yeah. So you can look at that if you want. There's very few places in the course you need to use that, but I know some people are, have been interested in it. Um, I'm going to come back to some questions as, as we go through these. A really important data type that will come up in your first assignment um, are both hash sets and sorry hash sets and hash maps. Um, these are just sets and maps. So sets you should be familiar with because it's like sets are just like a pool of um, unique things, um, and maps are basically just dictionaries. So if you've worked with you know Java, Python again, you would have been familiar with some kind of hash map, hash or map or dictionary. Um, but hash sets are hash sets are pretty straightforward. Um, the library we use is a standard unordered set, which I think is a C++11 feature. Yep, it's a C++11 thing. So this didn't exist until C++11. And this is a very, very critical um, uh, data type. So you can see here, um, we can create an unordered set of strings and we can add to it a series of strings like Lovelace, Babbage, Turing, Hamilton, Church, Borg. Um, and once we add them, we can check if inside of that Lovelace is contained within it, right? So an unordered set is an object itself and you can check if things exist in it. It has a whole bunch of methods you can insert into it. So this is just what you would add when you construct it. Um, contains a race, you can get rid of things in it. You can check if things are in it. We're going to talk more about this next week when we do the algorithms and iterators part. So don't worry about the finding an element part yet because we'll come back to that. You can clear it and then you can check if it's empty. So this is a nice little testing file to show you like the expectations you could have on a set. Um, and remember like a set functionally is just like a dictionary, uh, just like a vector. Like if I told you really simple to you know, read in a list of numbers and, you know, show me at the end which numbers appeared. Not how many times, just which ones appeared. You might store it in a vector and you might do a thing where every time you get a number, you check if it's in the vector and if it's not, you add it, right? You're effectively building a set. Um, it's just a language like C++ has a set built into it, so you can just use this. So if you, for instance, try and add Lovelace um, multiple times, it will just stay there once. So if I was to say do this line many times, it will not change the data structure after the first one because sets can only contain, contain one of a particular data type. It can be a set of strings, it can be a set of ints, it can be a set of whatever. Why we care about using these data structures is because, and again we will talk about this next week, but different data structures have different properties. So for instance an unordered set here um, will have like its certain member functions like um, look up, find, for instance. Um, you can see here that if you have a set, the time complexity of looking up a, a member of a set, seeing if something's in the set, is average, um, uh, average constant. 
Um, I'm not sure how the set's implemented underneath the hood, but basically sets are used because of their performance. So they're constant time lookup on average, which is exceptionally good, right? Like if you're dealing with huge amounts of data, that's so much quicker than anything like a vector or a linked list. Um, so performance is a big thing um, and inserts probably constant time or more. I don't know. Yeah, so inserting is average case uh, constant time, worst case O size. Um, uh, one to four. I mean, you can read about this all you want, but it's this essentially a set is like a, it's essentially like a hash or a dictionary where you don't care about the value, right? You're just storing keys. So um, it's not ordered, which is a problem, right? Like the biggest reason you use an array or a linked list is because there's a sense of order to it. But uh, with sets, you don't really care as much. So that's that's a hash set. Um, the hash map is pretty similar, except there's a value. So you'll actually notice here with vector and with unordered set, we gave it a type that we want it to be for, int or string or something. But for a map, we actually give it two types. Um, so in this case, what we're saying is that we want to create a dictionary where these are the keys and these are the values. Now, again, if you've used other kinds of, like Python is a great example, because with Python, um, all of your keys, I think, mostly have to be strings. Whereas in this, in C++, you could make an unordered map of anything. You could make it be a ints to doubles or strings to ints or ints to strings. Um, but the main point is an unordered map is a collection of keys mapping to values. So it's, it's a dictionary, it's a map, it's a hash. There's tons of different... Some of you would have seen this data structure in some fashion. Um, and its usage, usage is pretty intuitive too. This is another C++11 feature. So you can see here that um, a test case, a hash map, we're creating country codes. So we're mapping country codes to country names. So we're mapping strings to strings. We're going to populate it with a bunch of them here. Um, we can check if the country codes contain this key. We can check if country codes does not contain this key. Um, and then there's some other functions here, but in place, which is add. So this is kind of like push or um, add. And again, similarly, you can go straight to the C++ reference and go have a look at an unordered map. And an unordered map, it'll show you. It's like you can insert into it, you can emplace into it. Um, and they, these will all have time complexities as well. And like uh, looking up, where was the lookup one? At find. So similar thing here, find is constant time on average and insert is more complicated, but generally it's very quick, right? So these are not, des these, these are designed for add and lookup. They're not designed for printing. They're not designed for listing, ordering or anything like that. So super, super helpful in a lot of contexts, but yeah, sets and maps that's what we're dealing with here these are just more of the examples um, you can do more with it i don't need to take you through every single thing about c otherwise we'd be here for four years um, but it's mainly just trying to give you an overview um, so some of the questions um, map is just like the dictionary of python yep mapping's just like dictionaries and um, uh, unordered map is just like a dictionary in python um, is auto s equals unordered map preferred over From scratch, I, I don't think we have a preference for that. I'll have to get back to you on that, but we do talk about it in week three. So if you can wait till week three, you'll get a better answer, I believe. Um, and is a set a hash map without a value? Yes, it is. That's correct. Um, I'm not too sure on Min and Devanche's questions, so you might have to explain those two again to me. Um, Cool. So last couple of things before we get onto the assignment. Um, so this is just thrown at the end of this because I think it's really important, which is understanding the different types of errors you get in your code because your programs will have different errors. Sometimes they'll go wrong for different reasons. And it's important that you're able to appropriately communicate with people, um, you know, like what's actually going wrong. So for instance, the four types of errors here. First one's a compile error. Compile errors are pretty straightforward. It's when a compiler knows something's wrong, right? You go to compile, it's like, nah, that doesn't make sense. So if you just say A equals five, it's gonna be like, what's A? You haven't defined or declared what A is. I have no idea what that is. Um, please don't do that. 
So that's a compile time error. We all get that because we know the compiler fails. One thing that we you probably aren't familiar with though as much is um, link time errors. And these are really important to distinguish between because a link time error, we can try this out. Let's just override, um, let's override 110. So we've got this really simple program here. And it's a main function that tries to print out the return type of um, is 6771. Now, in another world, we would have implemented this. We would have said is 6771, and we would say bool, and we would maybe return true, like this. Um, why does that look so funny? Oh, there we go. Sure, that's probably fine. And when I try and run this, it probably works. Right, and then we can probably run it. And it says one, right? Because bool is when you try and print out a bool. But here's the thing, if we don't do this, it will still compile, it just won't link properly. Because remember, your C++ programs are a series of files that are all compiled separately and then linked at the end. So if I build this, you actually get a different type of error. And it's really important to understand that this is not a compile error. This is a linking error. Your code has successfully compiled. You could compile this to a .o file, but what you can't do here is actually turn those compiled files, link them together into an executable, something that you can run. And that's because it compiled this, but when it went to link them together, it was like, I cannot find this function. You did not link me with another compiled thing that um, I can actually finish this with. So they're linking errors. So it looks like a compile error, but it's actually a step beyond that. Um, we have runtime errors, which are things that we can't detect at compile time that go wrong. So for instance, you know, if someone, the file can't be found or, or anything like that. Um, pretty simple, like divide by zero, um, 10 of 90, things like that. Runtime crashes. Um, and then we have logic or programming errors. So these are things that um, don't always crash necessarily, but um, sometimes they're undefined behavior. So these are sometimes the worst things. So these are when like um, the compiler doesn't care, in runtime it doesn't crash the program, but it doesn't do the right thing. And these are the most dangerous types of errors that exist. So for instance, this is valid code here to say auto const empty equals standard string, and then to try and index the zeroth element. Because in C++ for performance reasons, uh, it does not do bounds checking on indexes. So just like C, if you try and say empty of zero, or empty of one, or empty of ten, C the C plus plus like will not um, the C plus plus the uh, you know at runtime it will not check it for you. So this code will actually run, and it might seg fault. It might not. It's what we call undefined behavior. The compiler says. Um, you know, uh, I will do my best, but like anything's kind of possible. Um, and a similar kind of thing here, um, this could also be bad. So this is these are like logical programming errors. They have undefined behavior. In general, as a principle, um, everyone in the world wants to move these errors up. So for instance, like compile errors are great. They're the best kinds of errors. Compiler picks up on it, notices it. We all want compile errors. In a perfect world, everything would be done at compile time, right? So that, like, and that's what tests are. Like, tests aren't for compile errors. Tests are for runtime errors and program logic errors. So um, that's why we like type languages. That's why all of this, because we can move it further up towards compilation. And that's why these ones are so dangerous, because there's less and less eyes on them to make sure they're working. So the very last thing before we get into the assignment is just a tiny little demo on file inputs and outputs. Um, this is not that important. I, this wasn't actually normally included. I only included it today or like, like this week because I thought that people are curious about it. Um, and I'm not going to go through it in excessive depth. It's actually just here as like a code sample for you to play around with. Um, but essentially in C++, when you open files and you, when you open files, you generally open files as a stream. So in C++ there's this notion of a stream which is kind of like a buffer um, or whatever where if I want to open a file to write out to 
then I will create an output file stream or OF stream and I'll call it F out and I'll give it the name of the file. So this is me saying I'd like to open this file to write to it. Um, and then if I want to start writing to it, I might open another file called data.in um, which is me opening an input file stream. And you've probably seen in your tute, and if you haven't already, you will see that you can actually like read from um, standard CN. So like in the tute, we do something where we're like CN and read into a variable. CN is just a stream. You're, you're taking that stream and you're reading into a variable. It doesn't have to be standard input. It can actually be a file, which is what's happening here. So you're saying that we want to open this file, data.in, as an input file stream, and then we want to stream out of that file into a variable some data. Um, and then on that input file stream there's some things you can check like is it a bad file, is it the end of the file as you're like looping through that, um, etc. You, you can also close the file at the end. Now again there's a lot to this, we could talk about this for 20 minutes if we want to and we don't actually get you I don't think to explicitly do any opening or closing of files anytime and soon. Um, so it's more again just like a you know this is doable go play around with this example if you'd like to um, and uh, you know you can ask questions about it in your tutor on the forum and stuff like that um, so I'm just gonna answer a couple of questions so um, just to jump back to demo 112 Javanch says if you go to line 21 yep um, you see this for auto construct um, if name is just an address why can you print the value that name is pointing to? Well, it's not an address, that's what I mean, like references aren't addresses, they're aliases, as in name is like just because it's a reference to it, it doesn't mean that name stores a pointer, it's saying name, if you use name it's like you're using the real thing so printing name is like printing what it references, they're identical um, Peng says, how can we distinguish these two from the output? I'm sure that was from a previous question. I'm sorry, I must have missed that. Um, and then on IO here, um, what does in mean? Yeah, it means read into it. Um, what I'd say is go to your tute this week if you haven't been already or go watch the recording because um, we do talk about streaming from standard input a bit and if you can understand streaming from standard input then it'll make a lot more sense what streaming from an input file stream actually does as well. So you can check that out. Uh, Min said okay so I understand Min's question so what Min's asking here is I basically I thought references could only reference one thing and we can't redefine them then how is name here um, referencing all the different elements in it right like if it can only reference one thing why doesn't it kind of like fail after the first time um, and the reason for this is kind of a little bit complicated but basically every time a for loop runs it's like it's in its own scope again um, and we're going to talk again more about scope in week three but essentially each time this for loop runs it's its own scope that's why in for loops you can do something like int j equals three and you don't get like a compile error saying it's redefined because every time you for loop it's like it's a new thing so everything that's defined and declared in that, that for loop gets like kind of removed at the end of the loop like if, if, you de if you defined it in there right so if I do this this is what we call a redefinition error the compiler will complain it will say you cannot do this on line 23 because you've already done it on line 21 but if I just do it on line 23 it will um, be okay because every time it loops it's a new scope it's kind of like refreshed in a way. And it's the same thing with the for auto const reference name. Um, it's like a new thing every loop. So that's why it's not a problem because it's, it's, it's kind of removed and then recreated every time. <clears throat> um, linked list would still be implemented with pointers. There's, there's lots of things you still use pointers for. Um, linked list would be one of them. You, you can't, references are not replacements of pointers totally, they are they are much safer, easier, clearer way
to achieve what you want to achieve with pointers most of the time. Pointers still have their place, absolutely. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to use pointers in C++ anymore. Um, are there ways to differentiate two variables with the same values? I don't understand what you mean, sorry. Oh, great, answer's yours too. Excellent. Okay, let's move on to assignment one because we've got 23 minutes left. Um, I will literally push this out after the lecture. So it's coming straight out after the lecture. Ah. Okay, let's do it. Oh, let me hit, let me stop the recording. Start another one.